All right, we will reconvene open session meeting at 504. Sorry, there's only three of us here today. We did have two that could not make it today. Okay, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, we will now recess into the California Military Institute meeting. We will recess at 5.05. Thank you, CMI. Okay, we will reconvene the, the regular board meeting of the Paris Union High School District at 520. We will continue with item 8.1, revision adoption ordering of the agenda. Do I have a motion? Second. Mr. Garcia with a motion. Mr. Stafford with a second. Please vote. Okay, the revision adoption ordering of the agenda passes 3-0. Any report out of closed session? No report this evening. Thank you. And 9.2, district update by the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Nellison. I don't <clears throat> I don't see Master Sergeant Puebla here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're all awake here, right? We're all we, awake? Do we have AMR here to take care of me? So, <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I, I was looking for you back there, Sergeant Puebla, Master Sergeant Puebla. Uh, I'd like to introduce Master Sergeant Frank Puebla from Paloma Valley NGROTC. Good evening, uh, distinguished members of the board, ladies and gentlemen, family, friends. Uh, before I actually start this brief... Uh, I would like to start off with a with a clip if you would indulge me please. I, I thought Mr. Hauser was coming up to take care of the technology for a minute. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you as a very, very proud instructor of the West Coast Wildcat Battalion. I got some great kids, as I'm sure every school has some great kids. The purpose of my visit today is really just to brag about them a little bit. You know, uh, right on the table is, is the fact that we have been invited to compete at the national level. So, currently, we are considered one of the top 25 schools in the entire nation to include Guam, Italy, and Japan that has a Navy Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps right now in top 25. Our endeavor, though, is to go to Pensacola, Florida on the 5th of April, travel on the 5th of April, uh, get there on the 6th to knock off the cobwebs, and it starts the 7th and the 8th, and we'll be back on the 9th. The intent, two years ago, we did go over there and represent uh, Parish Union. We represented the city, and we did very well. We ended up 17th in the entire nation, and that's out of 613 schools, so 17 out of 613. But we're poised now to finish in the top 10. I'm super excited about it. And uh, currently, we're trying to get a free ride by the Navy, and we'll see if that works out. They put us in Category 3, and we'll see how that works out. 
Uh, but in addition to the, to the Nationals, I, I also wanted to just to share some other great news because we're more than just an, an amazing drill team. We are a character-developing program. We, uh, we develop the leaders of the future. And we do this how? Well, of course, we teach it. We model it. But then we facilitate opportunities for them to put it into practice. Uh, things uh, and, and our staple really is, is community service. Uh, currently, uh, we're on track to hit or maybe surpass our normal hours, uh, cumulative, and that's between 3,000 and 3,500. I anticipate we're going to match it and potentially go above that. Uh, you know, and some of the community service, we spoke a, a while back about that, you know, during the holidays and whatnot. But in addition to, to those kind of things where we raise money for food baskets and things, but we also are with Just Serve for uh, Menifee. We, we go on to Just Serve. And uh, as a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, we helped with the Ed Camp. We had a, a few cadets over there uh, running the show with that, trying to do their thing. Uh, on April 1st, uh, Menifee has a, has a uh, it's going to be at Bell Mountain. They're having a giant community event. We got about 50 cadets going over there. And uh, Laladera Park often uh, taps into us. And on April 22nd, we will uh, have probably close to 80 or 90 cadets uh, with Just Serve. Uh, in addition to that, you know, uh, I don't know if other schools do it, but our school does a top 25, you know, the senior class, junior class. And I'm proud to tell you that I have 15 cadets that are in the top 25 uh, of all the, the classes right there. I was beside myself with pride. But even better than that is 10 of the 15 are my freshmen. This is the best freshman class we've ever had. Uh, in fact, eight of the freshmen made it to uh, – to, to qualify with us to go to nationals. Freshmen competing at the national level, this is how good our future is. Uh, in addition to that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, college, I have 19 seniors in the program, 19 seniors in the program, and all but one is pursuing higher education, minus the six I got going to the military. Uh, but in the military, because we have Navy scholarships, we have one of our cadets that got accepted for the Naval Academy Prep School. So that means the following year, he's automatically getting into the Naval Academy. I, I have two cadets that are juniors that are going to jump in there as well. But nevertheless, uh, I won't take up too much more of your time, but I do want to say that on uh, March 24th, and I know it's the same time CMI has their, has their get-together with uh, what may or may not be a tight uniform. Uh, <laughs> but we, uh, we, uh, we also have – is he here? Get it. Band of Brothers. Uh, but we also have our annual military inspection. And this is when we do a pass and review, very military in nature. It's a, it's a beautiful event. All the cadets will be involved. The stands will be full with, uh, with community members. And please, if you, if you find it in your schedule, I will have a VIP seat available for you. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, Master Sergeant. Uh, I have a few just announcement-like things I wanted to share. Um, I was lucky enough on February 25th to participate in the Paris African American History Day event over at Foss Field. We did a unity walk down D Street, and then they had a really nice event there with music and performances, and we had um, about 30 of our students from the district get recognized for their um, efforts and their strong um, work ethic in class. Um, I was also able to, with with... Um, Mr. Stafford to be the one of the judges for the Poetry Slam, which was a district-wide event for as held at CMI. It was we had a good time doing that. It was the kids were very, very talented. talented. It was good to hear the hear some of our kids uh, be able to put their words onto paper and then express themselves so well. Last night we were at a Paris High for Open House. It was a nice event. They had a, had the gym all set up for uh, parent conferences and was able to give Mr. Stafford a, a tour of the new building over there that opened up. Some really cool things that have come up. Um, just last Saturday, Candace Rain, sitting next to me, was named the California Association of Educational Office Professionals Administrator of the Year. And at the same meeting, oh, yeah, we can give her a hand. And at the same meeting, Lori Ortel was named the Educational Office Professional of the Year for California for that organization. So, congratulations, Lori. Not, and I'm not sure Candace is winning all these awards of what's going on. But <laughs> she's also received the Star Administrator Award from the F 
FFA for the Riverside section. Then she went on and she was selected for Southern Region um, Star Administrator of the Year Award. Now she's eligible for the state award. She's one of five finalists for the state award, and she'll be going up to Fresno within the next couple months here to be, and they have to do an interview and everything. So we're looking forward to having Candace as a state winner also. So congratulations, Candace. Um, on October, on October, <laughs> April 19th, we have, we have three administrators that were selected from the AXA Region 19, and AXA Region 19 covers the whole Riverside County. And they were, they were county winners, and we all want to recognize them this evening. They'll be recognized at that event also. And we had Nick Newkirk as the Business Service Administrator of the Year. Congratulations, Nick. We have Shane Pinnell, who's the Technology Administrator of the Year. He's not here this evening. But. And we have uh, Myra Chavez, who's the Confidential Employee of the Year for the organization. So congratulations, Myra. They'll all be recognized on April 19th at the Riverside Convention Center, a very nice event, and we're looking forward to that. And I want to, that's uh, the end of my report, Mr. Nelson. Well, actually, <laughs> we wanted to make sure that we let the board know he'll, get, he'll kick me later, but uh, Grant Bennett was uh, nominated as the AC incoming AXA Region 19 president, so we wanted to recognize him for that. Okay, thank you for the update. Okay, 9.3 student representatives. I guess I get to start. From Heritage High School, student representatives Daniela Lopez and Ashley Garcia. Um, good morning, President Arauz. Good evening. Oh, good evening, sorry. <laughs> Oh, okay, so good evening, President Arauz. Well, he's asked. Um, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Bennett, members of the cabinet, my name is Daniela Lopez. And I'm Ashley Garcia. And these are some of the recent happenings that are at Heritage High School just the past couple of months. Um, congratulations. Oh. So congratulations to our student of the month, Miranda Bell. She is an awesome student involved in engineering, robotics, NHS, and other clubs and academics on campus. We had, yeah, we had our FAFSA fiesta last week, and we rewarded all students who submitted their financial and application aid applications. About eighty-five of our seniors and counting. The fiesta was very fun, filled with prizes, piñatas, and music. Our staff of the month on campus is our supervisor, Joshua Rushing, and our Ag FFA teacher, Mr. Daly. Our vegetable judging and nursery landscape teams went to a competition at Miracosta College and took first place. Also, five of our of our students' projects won the Southern Region for the best project in a given area. They all move on to the state. We've had some pretty cool events celebrating the Black History Month. Our BSU club put together a nice dream wall with quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, we had a performance from our step team and a cool rap battle during lunch. Also, our students were honored at the Black History Expo on February 25th. Our French club had a nice trip to the San Diego Opera. Um, we had our last legacy march of the school year. It was for the spring sports. All the spring sports athletes, along with cheer, band, our sports challenge students, and ASB participated in it. Our students participated in the annual sports challenge event at Paris High School. This was a heartwarming experience, especially for us after going through the loss of one of our students. His family was there to supporting this awesome event. We've also had our Spanish spelling bee. The students had fun and worked hard to earn their trophies. We also had our annual top 25 GPA luncheon a few weeks ago. Hundreds of students with a GPA over 4.0 had drinks and snacks. Our American Sign Language class participates in community events where they engage in sign language conversation. Here's a picture of them at a local cafe. 
These are some of our upcoming events. Um, the Dance Showcase is March 16th and 17th, Patriot Olympics, March 24th, Career Fair, March 21st, Freshman Movie Night, March 30th, ASL Show, March 31st, Open House, 8th Grade Orientation, April 5th, Spring Pep Rally, April 7th. Please come out and join us. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Trustee Twyman's not here. Okay. From Paloma Valley High School, student representatives are Arabella Greenberg and Kayla Madrid. Good afternoon, Vice President Nellison, Board Superintendent Bennett, and Cabinet. My name is Arabella Greenberg, and this is Lily. I'm filling in for Kayla today. Okay. So first up, we have our Teacher of the Month Award. Get it? Okay. It's our AP Calculus teacher, Mr. Ryan Lundstrom. I know our students love him. Um, I always hear them talking, and I'm very excited to have him next year for calculus. So congratulations. There we go. <laughs> One more click. Okay, there we go. Our March student of the month is Cynthia Lopez. I actually got a chance to meet with her today to film our Wildcat chat announcements. And she plans to go to a four-year UC college and major in microbiology. So looking forward to see what she does. Today we had our FAFSA kickback. Um, I'm wearing this shirt as a dress, actually. It was really big, but I made it work. <laughs> <laughs> we make it work. Um, it was a really fun event, and I know it was a great incentive for students to submit their FAFSA. We had tacos, prizes, and I knew I wanted to submit my event so I could get invited to this it was very fun. <laughs> Last Saturday, we had the sports challenge. Um, our special ed students competed at Paris High School. I didn't get to go personally. I was very sad. But I saw a bunch of pictures, and it just made me smile. I know all of them had fun, whether they were special ed students or where they were student athletes volunteering. They just had a great time. Hey, this past Friday, we had our annual more pep rally and dance. The pep rally was a huge success. We got to see performances from different clubs and groups. And I know everyone had a good time at our dance. It was um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory themed. <laughs> next up, we had our food tasting. The students got to sample menu options for next year, and they were able to give feedback on it and write a review. So that's really cool. We had our Black History Month celebration assembly. I believe it was about three weeks ago. I heard much positive feedback. Everybody enjoyed it. Um, today, actually, for our video announcements, we did a recap on Black History Month. And they're very successful with a lot of events this month. Um, this Friday, they're having a DJ celebrate just the end of the month. And it was a great way to honor Black History. <laughs> yeah. um, here are our hosts for Wildcat Chat. Arabella and I are included. Um, these are our video announcements that we've been starting up. They're really fun to film. We just have a good time. And I believe this was our um, second? second, yeah, second episode, I guess, um, from last week, if you care to watch. That is it. <laughs> That's pretty much what's going on at Paloma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, Trustee Garcia. Now from Paris High School, Melissa Vasquez and Brisa Cardenas. Good evening. Oh, President isn't here. It's okay. It gives me time to practice how to say his name. Uh, good evening, President <laughs> uh, Vice President Nelson, board members. Superintendent Bennett and Cabinet, I'm Melissa Vasquez, your ASB School Board Representative, along with Brisa Cardenas. Alex going to be here today, but wanted me to, but she wanted me to remind you guys that Oklahoma was going to be showing this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. She would love to see you guys there. Um, this year, Sadie Hawkins was switched to more theme dance, playing off the backwards theme. Students were encouraged to come dressed in white, think, think kind of basic, generic, um, as opposed to a formal dance where nobody wants to be seen wearing the same dress as anybody else. Uh, this is a total, this, this event was uh, led completely by students. It was planned, decorated, hosted, and even DJed by ASB members. We had our spring, our spring rally to launch our spring sports that included boys volleyball, boys and girls track and field, boys and girls swim, baseball, softball, and golf. Speaking of sports, many, many great things have been happening with our sports. 
Baseball just defeated Elsinore in a 4-0 shutout. Boys volleyball won an Indian won the Indian Spring Tournament, defeating MLK High School in straight sets. Girls track defeated Moreno Valley High School, and softball also won their first two season games. Come, please come out and support our spring sports. Our freshmen were treated to a multimedia presentation by Camphill Pro- Productions, receiving a lesson on making good choices. And then our future Panthers came to Parasite to see all the amazing programs, clubs, and sports we have to offer. The day included 12 buses, 12 buses, 600 future Panthers, a, com- a combined 40 clubs, sports teams, and school programs such as engineering, two small pep rallies, an elective fair, and eight performances, and an early start to a late Friday start. Our seventh annual sports challenge took place last Saturday. Thanks to all who made this such a great district and community event. Open house was yesterday, and as we all know, the time has changed. The sun is out longer, and it made it such a perfect day for parents to come and come and meet teachers. Parents are welcomed by performances from Cheer and ROTC as they arrive early to pick up grades. Our student of the month, a big congratulations to ASB as President Azriel Sanchez for a well-deserved honor of being our student of the month. Coach Stanley is our teacher of the month for always being a coach who encourages his students to do well. Thank you and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Trustee Stafford. From Penacate Middle School, we have student representatives Sierra Mingo Gaines, Angelus Robles, and Fabian Guerrero. Two, just two. Good evening, Vice President Nelson, school board members, and members of the cabinet. I am Sierra Mingo Gaines, your ASB president, and here with me tonight is Angelus Robles, Vice President of ASB. When we arrived to Paris Paris High School, we were welcomed into the new gym to be informed about all of the club's electives and after-school activities we could join. After the new gym, we headed towards the second gym. Their students had the opportunities to join the clubs and sign up for classes. Our Pumas were also eligible to talk to the fellow members of clubs and electives. March 13th, Pumas the Panthers Part 2. On March 13th, Paris High Counselors, Clubs, FFA, Band, and ASV visited Pinacati students on campus to share their clubs, electives, and activities that we can join as upcoming ninth graders at Paris High School. In addition to Paris High Counselor, in addition, Paris High Counselors informed us on how to sign up for electives and classes and the grade requirements for each of them. March 13th through 17th, Spirit Week activities sponsored by the 7th and 8th grade classes. Monday was Twin Day, Tuesday was Wacky Hair Slash Hat Day, Wednesday was Crazy Sock Day, tomorrow is Throwback Thursday, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. You choose your favorite. And Friday is... Wear your favorite baseball jersey in honor of March Madness or any other sports jersey that is your favorite. March 18th, Penacati students will present at the National Q Conference. This coming, this upcoming Saturday at the National Q Conference in Palm Springs, Mr. Eric Anderson's class will present Finding the Magical in Every Day, A Journey into Abstract Photography. And Ms. Brenda Dyson Harris' class will present Design Thinking in Action. March 2nd and 23rd, parents, student, teacher conferences. Parents, students, and teachers will have an opportunity to sit for a brief chat during two days of parent conferences. Each semester, there are more and more families coming to the event to support their child's academic success. March 28th, Open House and Science Night. We would like to... Oh, nice for you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> We would like to invite you to our open house in science science night. You will be able to meet our teachers and staff, tour the campus, see the science projects made by our very own Pumas, see what's on campus in our student work. (laughs) Oh my God. The Puma Press student newspaper. The March Puma Press is now available online. Student PLTW blogs. 
These students have created their own student blogs as they work to improve their technical writing skills in their PLTW class. All elective students are focusing on improving their technical writing skills within content and context of their chosen elective classes. Spring sports started yesterday. Both girls and boys soccer went over the teams from Ethan A. Chase. Boys volleyball triumphed over St. John's. Girls softball lost their first game of the season to the ladies of St. John's. But the season has just begun. Go Pumas. Pina Cotti Drama will be presenting their spring production of Circus Olympus. Performances dates will be April 4th. Performances will be held during school hours. Top students will be selected by their teachers to attend April 5th and 6th. Performances will be at 3.30 p.m. April 7th will be the only evening performance at 6 p.m. Thank you for your kind attention. Stay possum. <laughs> Thank you, students from Pinacate. All student representatives, if you guys would like to go, you do not have to stay around. You won't hurt our feelings if you leave. It's okay. Okay, let us continue. Okay, item 9.4, PSEA president, Vicki Mueller. Is she here Ms. today? Ms. Mueller sent me a text saying she was stuck in Riverside and wasn't going to be able to make it this evening. Okay, do we have anybody else from PSEA here? Nope. Okay. Moving on. 9.5, CSEA president, Cinda Sarian. Vice President and board members, Superintendent Mr. Bennett and cabinet members. Hello. You know, today I am here just because I want to give thanks. I luckily was got the opportunity to go to the conference, the CAEOP conference, and I got to join other coworkers. There's about 20, 20 plus, and we got to go there and um, go to conferences, workshops, and just mingle and it was the best experience I've had the workshops were amazing the setup was beautiful um, I came back with just all kinds of knowledge and great speakers and just had a really good time so it was really cool and I just want to say thank you to the district for giving the opportunity to the employees to do this I know it took us away from our jobs that you had to do without us because we are you know the pinnacle of everything for you guys. <laughs> so that was a great opportunity, and I just loved it. I went there, met with coworkers, and I feel like I came back with friends because this was a time I got to sit with coworkers that I usually would just high and by and passing, but to sit and really get to know them, it just made a bonding, and it was awesome. So I came back, and I was like, I, I like to call them friends, not coworkers. So that's one thank you. The second right now is we have like 14 paraeducators at a conference right now. And again, that's because of the district. And I just wanted to thank you for that, for the opportunity for them to go to this conference. And hopefully they're going to come back feeling the same, the same way that I did, that they're going to come back friends, you know, meeting coworkers in that, that kind of way. And then coming back, it just changes everything. You learn different things about the people. And I just, I think it's a great opportunity and it's just wonderful. And again, thank you for that opportunity. And I also want to thank all of the administration at the school sites that had to do without these employees, you know, and to let them go. And they had to suffer and try to fill the spots and get everything situated at the school sites. But in the long run, I think it's really going to mean a lot to these employees to know that they, they were acknowledged and they meant something that we, that you afforded to let them go. And that was awesome. So thank you for that. And then the last is just the continuing tuition reimbursement education. We had eight, we had eight employees in January that finished classes, submitted to get reimbursed. So they're continuing their education. And again, the district is paying for that. And that's another thing that we need to say thanks. And thanks for acknowledging that to, to our members. And we need to get that out, that more members, you know, continue education. That's what it's all about. And that's pretty much all I have to say. I'm just grateful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Aaron. <laughs> o 
Okay, now we move on to 10.1, invitation to address the Board of Trustees on agendized and non-agendized items. I do have something, so I get to read my little spiel here. Bear with me. Individual speakers shall be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. The president may take a poll of speakers for or against a particular issue and may ask that the additional persons speak only if they have something new to add. That being said, I have one. I don't recognize the name. Joanne Cooley? <laughs> Never heard it before. About the agriculture in California and Colorado. Oh, Miss Cooley, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is my organic popcorn grown in Colorado. It's very good. I've had it before. <laughs> All of you had. Sure, man. <laughs> good evening again. Deja vu. Board members, cabinet, I'm here on behalf of agriculture in California and in Colorado. It's huge, and when I thought that maybe the program might be derailed, wow, you should have heard what I had prepared before. But <laughs> anyway, we're back on track, and I am very, very pleased. It is critical that the program keeps going on year after year with the FFA group that goes there, and the Colorado people love it that the, when the kids come out there, and they really show them a good time, and they do a lot of learning also. Last year, you didn't have to pay for anything, so because that was health reasons why that kind of got curtailed, but I wanted to tell you a little about, about agriculture. It's an important part of our economy. In Colorado alone, and California probably it would be doubled, it's a $40 billion economic activity annually, and it supports more than 170,000 jobs. Brett Rutledge, a couple years ago, my son-in-law, went to, on a farm tour to China, and he was there about three weeks, and about every third or fourth day, they would see one tractor. And the tractor that they would see would be like a 1950 tractor with no air conditioning, no technology, nothing. And right now, China cannot produce or grow enough food to feed its people. And by the year 2020, we will not be able to produce enough food to feed our people. So that's why it's so very important that this program continues. And the kids that we send to Colorado really, as I said, the farmers and ranchers love them. And they make themselves available for them. Uh, they learn to be good stewards of the land and of the farm. Um, I want to brag a little bit about Myra. She graduated last year from Paris High School. She'd been in FFA for four years. She wanted to go to Colorado State University. However, the out-of-state tuition is prohibitive. So she decided to go to Northeastern Junior College in Sterling. And there were three kids from here, from Paris High School, that did that. But Myra went above and beyond she is finishing her freshman year at Northeastern Junior College, majoring in agriculture, which we need more of. And she was recently awarded a paid summer internship with Smithfield Foods, which is huge, and it could be a very wonderful career opportunity for her. And that's just one kid in one year. So think what an opportunity you are providing for these students. And all they need is a little attention and a little love and a little nudge, and they do wonderful things. Johanna, I think, was there two or three years ago, and she is, where did I have it write it down? She is somewhere up north majoring in agriculture. Um, 
So these kids go on to do great, great things, and I do want to thank you for allowing the program to continue. And, you know, hopefully, till I draw my last breath, it will, <laughs> and my daughter, it will be something that we, we can encourage and keep doing. Any questions? <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Cooley. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. On to item 11.1, the consent calendar. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Mr. Stafford with the motion. Mr. Garcia with a second. Please vote. Okay, the consent calendar passes 3-0. Twelve point one introduction of promoted and or new employees. Yes, thank you, Mr. Nellison. I'm very excited. We have three new uh, people that were promoted into management positions. I want to start out with our new director of human resources, Mr. Nick Hilton. Nick's been principal at Paris High School, <laughs> ass assistant principal at Paris High School in Pluma Valley, teacher at Paris High School, graduate of Paris High School. His parents graduated from Paris High School, so a longtime Paris, Paris uh, citizen, and I want to congratulate him, and we're looking forward to great things with Nick and Human Resources. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Vice President Nelson, members of the board, Superintendent Bennett and Cabinet. Uh, would just like to say thank you for this opportunity. I would not be here today without the support of my family, which has come out in force. So uh, my wife, Myra, and my two children, wave your <laughs> and, and my parents, Russell and Mary. And I, I would also like to uh, thank the Human Resources Department for uh, their very warm welcome and show of support <laughs> this evening. So thank you all for coming. Uh, for me, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been thinking about this, realizing that uh, I have worked at a school site in some way, shape, or form for 19 years now, and to be moving into the district office is going to be a big change as I you know, am no longer around students on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to, to miss that aspect of what I do, but I'm also looking forward to uh, all the new opportunities and experiences that await me, and so thank you very much. I remember Nick when I, when he was a student at Paris High School. I was the athletic director at the time, and I blame Nick for my physique because he worked at McDonald's and fed, fed me too many Big Macs <laughs> through, through the drive-through. <laughs> our our next uh, promotion this evening, I'd, I'm pleased to announce, is Miss Jennifer Tomasian. Jennifer is <laughs> Jennifer was approved to be the new principal of Paloma Valley High School starting July 1st. Jennifer's been in the district a little over three years as an assistant principal at Paloma Valley. Came to us from Lake Elsinore before that. I want to say congratulations to Jen. It's all yours. Thank you, uh, Vice President Nellison, members of the board, to the cabinet, Superintendent Bennett. Thank you so much, and I am so grateful for this opportunity. Um, I would like to thank also, like Nick, my family. I would not be here without their support, both my parents, Chris and Gary Tomasian, who are here in the audience, and my beautiful... <laughs> And my beautiful fiance, Melissa. So thank you for your support. Uh, there is nothing I value more than the relationships that I have built with the staff, the parents, the students, the entire Paloma community over the past three years. Um, I am very excited for the work that we have done and to continue that work moving forward. And I know that together we're going to take Paloma to the next level. Thank you. And we have one more uh, new, new, this is a new employee to the district, not moving up within the district, but I'd like to ask Audrey Whitty, our Director of uh, Nutrition Services, to come up and introduce our new field supervisor. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, board, cabinet members, and uh, Mr. Bennett. I have our new field supervisor for Nutrition Services. Um, his name is Rick Linsolato. And Rick, if you'd like to come up, he comes with 20-plus uh, years um, in school nutrition and as a chef, and he's coming from Temecula Unified District. So he'll be uh, starting with us very soon, um, 
hopefully sooner than later. So, Rick. Thank you, Audrey. Good evening, Vice President Nelson, board members, Superintendent Bennett, and cabinet members. Uh, as Audrey mentioned, I uh, am a classically trained chef, 25 years as a chef. Uh, last 20 years, I've been a chef instructor in cul culinary schools, uh, including Le Cordon Bleu and the Art Institutes. The last three years, I've been in uh, school nutrition. I spent two years at Oceanside Unified School District as production manager and chef. Uh, did a lot of neat things, improving school food over there. Uh, the last year, I've been with Temecula Valley Unified um, as a supervisor, and same situation. We've really improved the food service. Uh, I'd like to take a moment and introduce my family who came with me this evening. I have my uh, wife, Sandra, my daughter, Sophia, and my son, Ricky. <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to join Paris uh, over the past couple of visits, I've had the uh, opportunity to meet and chat with Candace, uh, Tanya, Joe, and uh, Juno from Human Resources, and everybody's been very warm. Um, it's a great experience, and again, I'm very excited to go ahead and join the team and uh, be part of Nutrition Services and the department. Thank you very much. That's everybody tonight. Thank you very much. Welcome and congratulations to all of you. 12.2, report out of closed session. We are, no report. thought we already did that, but was it? Still no report, okay. Information report on after school transition plan presentation number 12.3. Ms. Zero, it looks like. And I'd like to ask um, Diane Martin, our coordinator of Ed Services, and Julie Zero, our director of curriculum and instruction, to come up and give the presentation. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. I'll go ahead and start. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Vice President Nelson, board members, Superintendent Bennett, and cabinet members. Um, we are here tonight to share a little bit about our programs and services that we offer throughout the district. Julie and I are going to cover tonight our after-school program. Our district currently has four funded, grant-funded um, after-school programs, two of which are at our middle schools, uh, Pinnacotti and CMI. Um, we hold two asset grants at Paris High School and Heritage High School. Our middle school program uh, focuses on three different areas um, within that grant program. Uh, academic support, which focuses on tutoring and homework help. Enrichment activities to support our academic achievement. Some of those include project-based learning modules that cross all content areas. STEM activities, college visits, game truck, arts and crafts, uh, youth development activities focusing on leadership, giving students a voice and exploring various roles in leadership, both um, opportunities on and off campus. Uh, the last one, part of our middle school program is the physical activity, which includes sports challenges, uh, football, basketball, soccer tournaments, um, agility training, and so forth. Our average daily attendance has been ranging anywhere from 60 to 90 student participants. Um, our program starts the first day of school and ends the last day of school. Likewise with our high school program, our assets program, uh, we also focus on individual uh, individualized homework assistance and alignment to the Common Core. Their enrichment activities really include more of a college and career readiness workshop, something that we've been working with our provider, which is through Think Together, is our workforce readiness program, which is a 10-week internship program where many of our students have an opportunity to earn a stipend of $300 after they complete 60 hours of work in the community. Um, many of their student-centered enrichment programs, which are offered on a monthly basis, rotate anywhere between uh, activities such as robotics, drama, choir, handball, poetry club, nutrition, and music. The last portion um, of the grant program is our family literacy. 
Uh, there's funds allocated to help promote our district goals, um, our LCAP goal. We include um, topics such as PK, which is our Parent Institute for Quality Education, our A through G, ESL, citizenship classes, as well as our Latino Family Literacy Night, PELI, which is our Parent Engagement Leadership Initiative. The high school attendance, daily attendance, averages well over 100 students. The funding that we receive, um, and it's just outlined above, is our ACES program, which is for the middle school. Those grants uh, renew annually. CMI carries about, on an average, $95,000 a year to support these activities. Pinnacotti is $65,000. We partner with uh, our Think Together. They basically are taking the program and doing all of the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, same thing at the high school. We have a base program or a base amount of $250,000 um, that's for each school, Paris High and Heritage, $25,000 for equitable access. A lot of these include the trips, uh, college trips, STEM activities, um, and then we allocate $20,000 for family literacy. So each school receives $295,000. We are in a multi-year contract. We are in, currently in year three of five. So um, we are looking to, um, as we end our contract and we're looking to renew, we are hoping to um, be able to transition um, into a more per year. Yep. So Julie's going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we face and, and our goals and our transition. So we're, as Diane stated, that we are looking um, over the next two years to really provide and put together a plan that helps us sustain this. Um, and when we apply for the grant again, we hope to apply um, as a single applicant so that we have a little bit more control over some of the programs. Um, some of the challenges that we have by contracting through a third party is um, we have a little bit more difficulty getting data analysis. We currently primarily just get attendance data. We would really like to see the influence of those programs with our students and the impact. Um, we've seen some revolving staff, not um, a lot of um, carryover from year to year, and we'd like to see a little bit more consistency with some of our staffing. Um, we would really like to look at being able to service all of our sites currently. As Diane stated, we just service four of our sites. Currently, we'd like to combine some of our ideas and the grant money to provide programs at all of our campuses to support the same needs of all of our students. Um, some of the challenges with um, the transparency and fiscal reporting, we have, they, they could get 95% of the grant money to oversee the grant. And oftentimes we don't get as much of the feedback as we'd like in regards to the spending. So we would like to have a little bit more control over how the money is spent. And then obviously the alignment of our services is really important. We want them to be aligned to our LCAP goals. So looking at college and career readiness, our um, PBIS data, as well as our parent um, involvement and the, just the proficiency data for our students. Um, so looking towards the future, we really wanna try and support it ourselves rather than having a third party. So the goal is to align our services to our LCAP, build sustainability after the grant. That's why we're talking about this now. Um, so we have two years to really put things in place so that we are able to sustain it. More accurate monitoring of our assets and resources, and then manage services appropriately and offer a more comprehensive plan to our students for all of the school sites. And so this is just some of the things that we really want to focus on as we start the planning process is, is looking at enrichment programs for all of our sites, the academic supports and interventions, um, some of the social and emotional supports and interventions. We'd like to take a little bit more proactive approach with those supports for our students, so developing more um, group type um, opportunities for our students, um, recreational programs at all of the school sites, and then um, just the prevention programs. I think oftentimes we really want to look at how to prevent things rather than be reactive, so really being proactive in how we approach things. So at this time, that kind of concludes our program. Um, is there any questions about our after-school program? Thank you. Thank you, ladies.
Okay, information item 13.1, discipline, February monthly suspension report. Fourteen point one action item. Uh, resolution number fourteen, sixteen to seventeen to close the academy community day school and authorizing related actions. Do I have a motion? Second. Mr. Garcia with a motion. Mr. Stafford with a second. We have a little presentation on this. Okay. If, By uh, all means. Mr. Ellison. Okay. <laughs> so as, as a district, we've been, we're looking at our programs and what we have to offer to kids and, and the success of some of our programs within the district. Um, and we had... Thank you, Sarah. Um, and we had us. We started looking at ways we were going to be able to save money with the budget. It's going to be going uh, bad, not as, not horrible, but we're going to. It's not going to be as strong as it's been over the past few years. And we started looking at what's going on at the academy, and we we after research, and we we came to the conclusion that it would make most sense to to, to close the academy. Academy opened in 1996. Um, and it, it, it serviced at one time, you'll see in a few minutes uh, how many kids we had there, but it, it was set up as a community day school, but it was also back then it was a credit recovery school for ninth and 10th graders. And uh, so it served a different purpose than, than we're looking at now. If you look at this, is the history of the academy uh, uh, enrollment. In, in 2006-07, we had 635 kids on that campus. And I think that's not including the independent study kids that were there at one time. Um, and the focus of what we wanted at the academy changed. We just we didn't think it was right to be sending ninth graders there because they failed four classes. It wasn't a, a good learning environment for them, and it was it was it was just six hundred kids on that campus wasn't safe. So we've really trimmed it down to be a, a true community day school. If you look at the population this year, we have th about thirty. Little over thirty kids there, right? That this, when this was done, we had thirty there, but I think it's at like thirty-five now. Um, so looking at that, it, it the population dropping, and we still have it fully staffed. Um, and again, it opened in '96. We had two campuses in 2006-07 when it was 635 kids. We took the middle schoolers, and we had a, a separate campus where they were where they were stationed um, over over where CMI is now. Um, the independent study program was there in 2007-8 because of the crowding. We moved it over to Paris, Paris Lake High School, you know, and as the, the it continued to drop in population there. Um, and we this year we tried something new and we tried three different programs there: the community day school program, the in, in lieu of expulsion kids there, and independent study. And it just didn't seem to be didn't seem to work real well. We we tried something new and it wasn't wasn't being successful. You know, looking at some of the success rate there, <coughs> our average attendance for this year for the CDS kids and contract kids is about 63%. Attendance rate, ADA there, and independent study, almost about 65%. And one of the telling things is um, the grade point average for the kids at the academy, CDS and contract is 0.89, not even 1.0 grade point average. So we're not showing real good success with the kids in the classroom. An independent study with a little over a C average. So our proposal for closing the academy, well, we would send the community day school kids to Riverside County Office of Ed Education at the Valverde Learning Center over off of Morgan. The in lieu of expulsion kids, we, we have some different options. We're looking at them with possible independent study and, and moving kids if they haven't done things so egregious to a different high school, transferring them between schools as a last chance opportunity. We would move the independent study program over to uh, Paris Lake High School to, to serve our independent study kids and, and including uh, Dr. Garcia as the principal over independent study and um, adult ed. <coughs> and why we're thinking of that is 
looking at the, pop, the enrollment at Paris Lake High School over the years, we started the seven period day two years ago, and if you look at the pot, how the how we're um, having the number of kids at that school, two years ago before we had seven period day, we had 301 kids there. This year, 254, and we're projecting next year to be at 215, because the kids have more opportunities now on their regular campus to make up credits with seven periods and not fall so far behind the necessity of being sent over to Paris Lake. And looking at it um, with the staffing we have right there right now, we're, we're overstaffed by the number of kids we're going to show there. We, right now we have 16 regular education teachers, and it's, the, the, uh, it's 16 to 1 right now is the teacher-to-student ratio in a classroom. And looking at the drop in population, it will be down to 13.5 kids to one teacher. So we're very overstaffed right now. Um, and we look at bringing independent study there to help with some of that overstaffing and possible transferring teachers, some teachers from the lake to other schools. And one of, oh, what did I do? I clicked too fast. One of the huge things is the cost of operating the academy. It costs us about $1.9 million a year to run the, the academy right now. Um, we have independent study there. It's about $100,000 to run that. Those kids would be transferred over to Paris Lake. So the cost of running it is $1.8 million right now, which turns out to about Fifty-nine thousand dollars a student that are going to school there, so it just it doesn't make it's not cost effective to, to continue what we're doing right now. You know, looking around Riverside County, there's only, there are only four districts in the whole county that have their own community day school, and those are Hemet, Harupa, Moreno Valley, and us. And if you look at those, we're, those districts are all at least twice as big as we are running a community day school. All the other districts, even the big districts like uh, Valverde and Temecula and Corona Norico, they don't they don't run their own community day school, and I would think it's because of the cost effectiveness of it. <coughs> so what are we going to do with the staff there? We went and met with the staff, and we let them know that not one person would lose a job out of out of this uh, closure of the school. We have four teachers. We have positions at other schools that we'd be able to transfer those teachers to. Our two counselors, we're going to have. At least uh, it's three counseling positions open for next school year. Um, so there's openings for them. The, I talked about the principal. She'd be going over overseeing uh, adult ed and independent study. The classified staff, we have some openings right now. The others, we would, we would be overstaffed for a period of time at the school, but we're looking at Paloma Valley growing so big, going to be at 3,300 next year. They could use some extra campus supervisor help, probably some, possibly some extra clerical help to help uh, deal with the number of students they have. But what we're showing is the very first year, next school year, we'd be able to sell, save $1.2 million. And then the savings will continue to grow as the, we don't have to, we wouldn't be overstaffed as cl um, some of the classified positions fill in from attrition. And, that, and that's the end of our... Uh, Proposal: we'd, we'd like to uh, urge the board to vote yes on this from the district standpoint. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? No? Okay, if there are no questions, please vote. Fourteen point one passes with a vote of three to zero. Item 14.2, an action item, presentation of and approval of new district vision and mission statements. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Mr. Stafford with a motion. Mr. Garcia with a second. And we have a presentation. Ms. Ocedo. Keep my water here. I seem to be going into coughing fits. Okay. Vice President, President Nelson. Superintendent Bennett, cabinet, and guests, actually, because I'd like um, really to share all this information. One of the pieces of, um, of work that we've been doing is um, really taking a look at who we are as a district. We're, we're an org organic organization, which means we're a living and breathing um, group of people and organization that really needs to move and change and, and adjust with the students, the needs of our students, 
and also the needs of our community. And so we knew that this it was going to be really important that we take a look at our vision and our mission. And with um, the selection of Mr. Bennett as our superintendent and the election of, of new cabinet members, this is a perfect time to really sit down and analyze who we are and, and wh why we are and uh, what our, our goals and our, and our uh, vision is for where we're going. So because it's such a large um, endeavor, we um, asked the University of San Diego's Mobile Technology Learning Center to really come and help us in really grabbing information and, and really touching on all of our uh, stakeholder groups to make sure that we knew exactly what was important, what we needed as a community, and, and also what we already have in place. <clears throat> So what they did was they came in um, with their expertise and they um, helped us design what is called a 360 feedback. And if you'll look, the, the little diagram there on the left, we asked for analysis in three different levels. Foundationally, what are the physical resources we have? What are the, what's the human capital we have? Community resources. And then structures, what are the systems that are in place? What are the strategies that we use? And finally, practices. What, is, what, are, the, what are the practices that we have in our, in our uh, classrooms? So what we wanted to do was actually get feedback from all the different stakeholder groups. And I'll give you a little information on that. We did, we sent out surveys to all of our constituent groups, and we, from the surveys that we sent out, we got 1,703 responses. Of those responses, 47% of them were from students, 30 from parents, and 23 from staff. We had not only qualitative responses, which is where they, you know, they actually gave us some information rather than just picking A, B, C, and then quantitative where they got to pick from multiple choice under all of those categories that I just showed you. Some of the data sources, on top of the fact that we had the survey, we wanted to make sure that we had um, an opportunity to have person-to-person um, -person conversations. So. We had a select sample, six administrators were interviewed, 36 teachers were interviewed, and they were interviewed in focus groups where there were six teachers in each one. And then we did 33 classroom observations, seven of them in middle school and 26 at high school. And most of this was to um, take a look at, again, those same categories. Wanted to make sure that you that you saw what the breakup was because I know always um, our our cab uh, excuse me our uh, board is interested in making sure that we have representation and a voice from all of our stakeholder groups. So um, from the teachers, there's the data. We had teachers um, complete surveys, principals, administrators, and our classified staff. And they're right there, all the numbers. <clears throat> Once we had all of that information come in, the research team took all of the information that was that, that was gathered from the survey and from the interviews, and they looked at all the recurring themes and actually brought that to to us as, as committees. These are all of the recommendations in all of those groups of the chart that I showed you, and you'll have an opportunity to to go in and, and take a look at those in, in great detail. But under each of those categories, there the, it gave you a synopsis, gave us a synopsis of what the research showed and then what the stakeholders wanted to share with us under all of these categories. So physical resources, there were um, recommendations under structure, and you see all of the categories. And I'm not going to take the time to read that. Um, hopefully you'll be able to do that or that you have. Um, this is classroom um, practices. And then there were three key recommendations under three recurring themes. One was under vision. And what we, what we found was that it was important that we work with our stakeholders to make sure that we crafted a, a vision. In other words, who are we? Who are we and who do, who do we want to be in the future? And there and then what we do is we need to align all of our practices, policies, and procedures to that. Secondly was the leadership alignment, working with the sites and the district leaders to implement some of the vision and then make sure that we have put into place the systems and the, the, the procedures and the policies that actually support that. 
And finally, reflection is um, engaging the stakeholders um, so that there's reflection to, you know, are we in fact aligning? Are we in fact putting into practice the things that we as a community um, said that was important? Once that came to us through the research, um, that's where the where the work really began for us as a as a group of 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 individuals coming to, to really analyze because remember everything came to us from the research group this is what they found then they gave that to us and what we needed to do was we needed to take a look at it and based on what we felt um, from all of those perspectives if you'll notice we had parent representatives on the committee we had students district administrators cabinet um, CSEA and then PSEA and we actually had six representatives from every um, every stakeholder group participate and this is what we did with the information that was given to us we actually spent a lot of time sitting down looking at what it said um, getting some clarification what what exactly is a vision we spent time trying to figure that out what exactly is a mission so we, we spent two days okay. We spent two days working with all of the information that we got. The first day obviously we needed to sit down and get to know each other. You know, who are we? What's important to us? Why are we there? That was important. And then we started really taking a look at what are visions and what are mission statements. That included us going and taking a look at some samples from all sorts of um, different uh, um, organizations and looking at what, what they had chosen. How was that alike what we needed or what we felt was important? Um, and then after that, we, we synthesized all those ideas and we crafted that first day toward the end, we actually crafted some vision and mission statements. And each table group had one representative from each of those stakeholder groups. So as we were creating six of those, um, it had representation from each of the stakeholder groups. So that was day one. <clears throat> On day two, we took, again, we didn't, you know, you always do an icebreaker. And then we took a look at um, what are some of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that we want of our, of our graduates. We sorted through some of our own value statements, what we you know believed that um, all of our students should have when they when they left us, and then we developed a graduate profile, and it was really interesting to watch because we put all those attitudes and those skills on a piece of paper, and we all kind of stood in a in a circle, huge circle, and there were papers thrown all over the floor because we all put those ideas there, and then. From that, we took all of those ideas, everything that we got from the research, and we started to craft and really fine-tune. And from that, we revised the initial visions and missions statements that we did on day one. So this is what... Now, I have to tell you, we had, um, we had mm, five that we came up with as a team. And then at the end of day two, what we did was we identified the, one, the vision and the missions we thought best represented what we wanted. These were the two that, um, that we selected, not only with um, the committee input, but also then um, cabinet took the ones that, that we were given. So we have option one, and it states, Parish Union High School District will be a caring, diverse, and supportive learning environment in which all are committed toward working in a relationship to foster innovative and creative learning opportunities. This is a statement of who we hope to be. That's what we expect of ourselves. That's our best vision of us. The second one is Parish Union uh, High School District creates learning environments for all that are caring, innovative, and embracing of cultural differences while developing personal connections. Now, we brought two because while, and I'll be honest, while number one was, was the one that most people preferred number two was a close second and we thought it would be important for you to take a look at this and and as our board um and i know this was shared with you before tonight is look at these and um, give us input and help us select by being the final selector of which option you would prefer as a governing board and before i get to that <clears throat> This was the mission statement, and the reason there's not a choice is because this was the consensus. 
piece. The mission of Parish Union High School District is to create high quality relevant learning opportunities for all in a safe and caring environment. We will develop a high quality caring staff who will be dedicated to learning and connect students to their education and potential goal. We will care for all students while developing a growth mindset through collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking. This is what we say we will do if this is who we say we need to be. Does that make sense? Okay. So with that, I will let you know that while we've created our vision and mission and have given you some selections to help us with, the next steps, just so that you're aware, is once a selection is made, is then to communicate that out to all of our stakeholders as to what the final decision was. Any questions from me? I just wanted to share, <coughs> when I took over as superintendent, people kept asking me, what's your vision for the district? What's your vision for the district? And my philosophy was it shouldn't be mine. It shouldn't be a one-person thing. So that's why when I, I want, asked Marilyn, and, and we started working on this last year, is work on develop, getting this group to develop, uh, getting people together and be able to say, this is what we think the district should be. And this is this is the best work that I, I've seen come out of something like this. So I'm really proud of the work of our parents, students, staff, and administrators to make this happen. The quality of conversation from every single stakeholder group, from all of the representatives that were there, was so enriching that um, we had. I'll, I'm going to share this with you. We had a little bit of communication glitches with our PSEA representatives and it was so important to have them there that we created an additional day to get them caught up with us so that when they came in they could um, add their voice to that and it was absolutely phenomenal um, it, it, you know Mr. Bennett is absolutely right it was it was one of the best um, processes I've ever you know participated in so our recommendation as the cabinet would be um, option number one is the one we like the best on the vision, and then we have the one mission statement that was kind of consensus. But it's 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 totally up to you as a board if you would like to um, support that or not. I think number one is uh, is more direct and and more f focused on the things. We're, number two seems a little a little bit more generalized to me. So I, I would go with number one myself. So, okay. Well, what? Mr. Garcia, we haven't heard from you. Do you have any? Uh, now I could talk. <laughs> <laughs> Option one is definitely the way to go because it's the vision statement. I think with option two, what we're doing is making it more personal. And we need to be sticking to the point, which is the vision. So I would say option one, so, you know, you let me talk, so you know, I'm taking advantage of that. <laughs> That's what you're... Are, are, we, are we calling for so, a vote? So, so you're in favor of number one. Yes, sir. You're in number favor one. of number... I'm in favor of number one, so we're going to amend our motion to choose... Uh, Vision statement option number one plus the mission statement that was presented. So, do we need a new motion? We don't. We've already have the motion, correct? So we don't need to. Okay. So, the amended motion is to choose option number one for the vision statement and the mission statement as presented. Any other questions, comments? None. Okay. Then let us vote. Okay, the motion as amended passes 3-0. Looks like we have a new vision and mission statement. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, board. I think Mr. Stafford had one question for you, uh, Mr. When Bennett. When will we make the switch, right away, or...? Yes, as we're, as we're, we're going to start publicizing it, getting it out, and on the websites, and and to to people, let them know what's going on. Okay, great, great. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna give. Uh,
communicate that to our committee first, the people that worked on it, okay. to be able to let them know what happened. Good. Okay, so that means we move to item number 14.3, which is also an action item. It is the approval of the 2016-17 second interim financial report with a positive certification of the Parish Union High School District's financial condition. Do I have a motion? Second. Mr. Garcia with a motion. Mr. Stafford with a second. And we have a presentation. Ms. Ra Ms. Rains. Okay, so I did note it. Did you find it? I thought you had it, Joe. So I'll, I'll go ahead and get started anyhow. But I, I, did, I couldn't help but notice the room cleared out when there was mention of a, you know, talk about the budget, you know. <laughs> So, um, uh, board members, with your permission, um, since, uh, well, and only three of you are here tonight, but since two of you um, are new board members, um, Grant and I got to talking and thought this might be an ideal time to do dive a little bit deeper into the budget and give you some background information that the previous board members um, have had, you know, being board members, and just take this as an opportunity to update you. So, Okay, so David will run to the restroom and <laughs> see, I tell you, they clear the room. <laughs> so, can we find it? Okay. <laughs> and I wanted to thank Mr. Rabing for um, uh, letting me have the floor um, tonight since it was a little bit more in-depth. Um, and uh, so I, it's, a, it's a big packet. I'm going to try to go through it fast, but then you have the information, and then, of course, you have access, you know, to me, us, all of if you have questions. Um, so we thought we would do that. We, I, I guess I'm by myself, and I'm thinking I'm a we. But um, so <laughs> I've got this divided into three parts. First, um, we'll review real quick LCFF and LCAP, which is the new funding model and transparency uh, measure. Um, then a little bit about the state budget with the governor's January proposal for the state budget for next year. And then we'll just look at what the details are for our budget as of second interim. So that's the plan. So we're going to start with the LCFF and LCAP review. Um, so with the onset of LCFF in 2012-13, uh, so we go back just a little bit, it was the most dramatic change um, in the school finance system since the revenue limits came into play in 1972. Um, it moved California to a weighted student funding methodology, and we'll talk a little bit more later what that's about. Um, what it did is it replaced the revenue limit system and the categorical system, which together made up the school finance funding system. It was different for every school district, similar to how LCFF is. Um, but we had revenue limit funding in a different amount for high school districts, elementary districts, and unified districts. And now it's by grade span, which we'll see in just a minute. Um, so it began, so it was implemented in 12-13 as a base year. And then in 13-14 uh, was the first year that we saw. Um, so with the LCFF, it also required an LCAP or local control accountability plan. Yeah, working. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So what that did is it links the LCFF dollars to the LCAP goals. And I know you have heard and will continue to hear a lot about the LCAP goals. Um, the planning process is intended to be very transparent with a group of stakeholders um, with an annual review. And so we do that, um, like other districts, in the beginning part of June with a public hearing for both LCAP and the budget. Um, so looking at revenue limit, the old funding system versus LCFF, um, the revenue limit, the old system, we had um, a series of unrestricted funds that were received through the revenue limit um, with very few restrictions, so no strings are tied, tied to those dollars. And then we received restricted funds, sometimes called categorical, so many different categorical programs, all with very different spending requirements. Um, what LCFF did is it took equal base grants um, per pupil in four different grade spans. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute that are the same for all school districts and actually all charter schools. Um, and then it took targeted supplemental and concentration funding based on fixed percentages and added those as a per pupil amount to the base grant. Um, um, also CTE funding and um, this doesn't apply to our district, but K3 class size reduction, CSR funds. Um, and then those fundings were differentiated um, based on three pupil characteristics called the unduplicated pupil count. So, And that's made up of our low income or our free and reduced meal program um, students, our English learners, and our foster youth um, and homeless students. So we get an extra bump 
um, for those students, and I'll explain how that works in just a minute. Um, so this just graphically represents the changes that were made by LCFF. We, I talked about we used to get our funding made up of revenue limit and of categorical funds. Now we get a base grant and supplemental, or sometimes called supplemental and concentration funds. Most of the time we just say supplemental and we just know what that means. It's our, our restricted, but they're not really restricted because now it's local control. Um, so I was talking about the unduplicated pupil count um, based on the LCFF subgroups. And so that's our English language learners, our free and reduced meal count, and our foster youth. So you can see here in our district in 2016-17, our total district enrollment at CalPads or CBEDS time was 9,755. And you can see the different uh, student counts and percentages um, that we have, and those are some of those students can be duplicated. So the way we come up with an unduplicated pupil count is where is their crossover um, in those categories. And so you can see the different representation there, but our unduplicated pupil count for where we get that extra bump for supplemental and concentration is for 7,218 students um, or 73.99% unduplicated pupil count. Are we good so far? <laughs> okay. So it really simplified state funding. It took this base amount per student, gave you grade level funding, some additional funding based on your demographics, and then these, these became your dollars, or are our dollars now. So let me walk through what those calculations look like. I won't go through everything on here. Maybe we'll just focus on the 9-12 since that's the majority of our population. Um, so this, these are 17-18 numbers. There's no COLA in 16-17, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to explain. So we're going to look at the, what the projections are for 17-18 just for purposes of the example. So in 16-17, the current year, our base grant per ADA, so that's our completely unrestricted um, money uh, for the 9-12 population is $8,578 per pupil. Then we'll add the COLA, the projected COLA in this case, 1.48%. 8,705 is our new base grant. Um, we then take that 8,705 because we are a high school district. We get additional career tech ed money. Yay. Um, $2,226 per student. <laughs> and so now our adjusted base grant per ADA is $8,931. We then add on the supplemental and the concentration um, dollars to that, and that's a unique dollar amount based on our unduplicated pupil account. So now our total LCFF target, target's a keyword here, per ADA is $11,100. And so this is what our funding would look like in the different grade spans that we have, 7, 8, and 9, 12. Multi the ADA in those grade spans multiplied by the target um, per ADA. Um, when these laws were made, um, it was very difficult to get all the categoricals away because, you know, everybody has their, their reasons for the categoricals coming into play. They could not get um, the targeted instructional improvement block grant out of the formula or transportation. So those are add-ons at the end. Um, so if all things were as intended, our funding for next year including base grant, supplemental concentration, and everything we've talked about would be this $102 million. However, that's a target. And so for those of us that remember the revenue limit days, we had a revenue limit, and then sometimes the state would say, oh, we can't afford to pay all of that. We're now going to apply a deficit factor. So it's very similar, the deficit factor, to a gap funding percentage, which is what we deal with now. So... Um, in the old days, we had our revenue limit and our categoricals. Again, now we have our base and our supplemental. But when the state cannot afford to pay everything that they say they owe us based on this target, uh, there's a gap. And so let me show you what that calculation looks like. Let's just look in the center column in 2017-18, since that's what we've been talking about. Um, so this $102 million that we talked about a second ago, then it subtracts the funding floor, which is very close to your funding um, the year before. It's a kind of a complex formula because it uses 12, 13 categoricals as a base and your new ADA. Um, but it's, there's a formula that establishes your floor. Um, and then, so what's the difference? What's that new money? And then when the state can't afford to pay you all of the new money, they establish what's called a gap funding rate. So currently, that is projected for next year at 23.67%. So we would, in terms of new money, and this is really important, we would only receive $1.6 million of the 6.7 that we were allocated. So back in 1314, um, that $6 million number 
was like 32 million, 33 million, something like that. So we really did, even though that kind of hurts to see that number, um, we need to kind of keep in mind there was a lot of money infused into education with the onset of LCFF. So it, ultimately it was a good thing uh, for school districts. Um, and then we come up with, after we only get that $1.6 million, we have our LCFF entitlement. So then our average um, per ADA uh, funding per student is 10436 projected for next year. Um, the only thing I can tell you about that number is it's probably wrong because these are projections based on the governor's January budget. There's going to be a lot of changes uh, between now and then. So we good on LCFF and LCAP? Okay. I hope that helped to give, um, especially our new board members, a little bit of a review. So with the um, state budget, um, as you know, the governor proposed his first blush at the budget for next year in January. Um, the economic, economic conditions, of course, continue to define um, the options for the state. We're still controlled by Prop 98. Um, we've got lower than expected state revenues we've been dealing with this year. The forecasts um, for Prop 98 um, indicate low growth. And um, ultimately, I think we all know this, um, good times are followed by bad times. And so um, I, I'm standing up here a little bit knowing I'm a little bit the Grinch, <laughs> and, and, uh, but it is what it is. So for those of you that don't know, uh, Prop 98 was adopted by the state voters in 1988. It serves as a constitutional minimum um, for our funding. Unfortunately, that minimum has really funded it as our, as our maximum. Um, but as I said before, in recent years, K-14 education um, has really seen these unprecedented boosts in funding um, because of the economy um, as well as you know just the implementation of LCFF. However, that boom has probably come to an end uh, next year. So for Prop 98, um, the governor's budget proposes um, $71.4 billion for Prop 98. That's a decrease of $506 million um, that was projected in June with the enacted state budget. Um, and then Prop 98 funding of $73.5 um, billion um, next year, down $953 million from the forecast levels. So none of this was good news, um, but this is why, um, you know, you as a board and we as a district, we certainly appreciate your direction um, in keeping adequate reserves so that we can um, react to uh, situations where the budget changes on us uh, just like that. Um, and then the maintenance factor increases as far as Prop 98 as well. So it's just a quick graphic um, showing Proposition 98 funding from 2008 to the projections next year. Um, and then as far as the local control funding formula, the budget proposes $744 million for continued implementation of LCFF. The key thing I want everyone to understand there, that new money, even though there's that gap funding percentage, that really only funds the COLA. And we'll talk about that um, in just a little bit. Um, there's also one-time discretionary funds, so this is good news. Um, additional funds in the budget proposed for 1718 of 48 dollars per student, and you can see the history of the one-time funds um, that we've had. One thing that it's often very difficult for many of our stakeholders, including our employee groups, to understand: um, when we get one-time money, year after year after year, it feels like ongoing money, and we can't spend one-time money on ongoing expenditures. So that's just always a conversation and um, an opportunity to, we have to explain that very carefully. Um, we are also dealing, these are very important factors in our budget, uh, PERS rate increases. Uh, you can see um, what the projected rate increases are. I'll show you what that looks like for our district in just a minute, as well as CalSTRS increases. And one thing I wanted to talk to you about, you probably heard a lot about this, is the cap on district reserves. There's legislation that would place a cap on district reserves. So it, for a district our size, we couldn't have more than 6%. But four conditions have to be met in order for that to take effect. And currently, two of those have not been met. Um, so um, I didn't mention the California state budget information here is directly from School Services of California. This is one of their graphics. And so their statement was, you know, the governor had it right. Hold on to your reserves um, because of the uncertainty in the state budget. So, again, at least two of the four um, provisions will not be met next year. So what's not in the budget? Um, 
Uh, nothing in the budget to address the increases in STRS and PERS that I talked about. There's no new funding for special education above the 1.48% COLA. No new funding for home to school transportation. Nothing to fund to close the LCFF gap. And then nothing to deal with in terms of additional investments to deal with the state teacher uh, shortage. So how do we prepare for the future with our multi-year projections? Um, the good news is uh, we are doing all the right things, but uh, this is the advice from school services. A uh, reminder that on the natural, our costs continue to rise uh, regardless of anything else. Our employees have step increases. They have column uh, movement um, that they're allowed by contract. Uh, there's increases to health and welfare um, every year. Um, and then the STRS and PERS contributions that I mentioned. Uh, contributions to our restricted programs um, continue to increase, um, mainly in the special education um, arena. Um, and then the key thing is the new revenues that we receive, they're not going to cover our new costs, especially in the out years. Um, ongoing revenues um, rise by the, the COLA, 1.48%. And most, in most districts, the ongoing costs will be increasing by about 4%. So the math doesn't really work out there. <laughs> um, and again, there's no such thing as a good budget without an adequate reserve. So um, we've done a good job there. Okay, we're on the home stretch. So this is <laughs> my keeping within my allocation. <laughs> um, so just really quick what our budget looks like given um, all of the conditions I described. Um, you can see our enrollment projections um, for the current year. Uh, I'm sorry, the previous year, the current year, and the, the two out years, as well as our ADA. I do want to highlight our ADA to enrollment percentage um, and explain why we have increased the ADA to enrollment percentage. Remember, we're only paid based on students that actually show up um, for any portion of, of a day. And so you can see in the current year, we're at 93.3%. We're projecting 93.51% next year, and then 93.71% the following year. The reason for that is we entered into a contract last year, around this time, I believe. So this sort of the get everything set up year with attention to attendance. Um, it's a contract that we had, I don't know, seven or eight years ago when Grant was the director of pupil services. Um, and he, along with the then fiscal director, um, worked with the assistant principals over attendance, and they were very successful. So we have the proof that shows this program works. We had to cut it from the budget because of the budget was bad, and we thought we could continue some of those um, incentives and so forth ourselves, but um, it turned out that we really need um, the program. So Grant actually recommended bringing that back when he was the assistant super of ed services, and so... Um, we're really working hard and we'll continue to work hard and plan to see those increases starting next year and the year after. So we've got to get our kids to school every day. That's important for reasons beyond money, but we're talking about money right now. <laughs> so um, we talked about our costs rise on the natural. You can see here um, what our step increases are, health and welfare increases, as well as the STRS or PERS increases based on the different employee groups. I won't read all of those to you. Um, and then this is what our budget looks like. Um, it's our multi-year projection for the unrestricted general fund. Um, and so if we look at the current year, I mean, in each of the years, you can see the beginning balance, the total revenues, the total expenditures, and then the total ending balance. Um, as you know, as I think most people here know, we have not settled with any of our district bargaining groups yet. And so our ending balances are quite a bit high and they grow in the years because we are still negotiating. Once those agreements um, come, come to you for approval, um, those monies and the ending balances beyond, you know, what we, what we keep, um, which is typically 6%, which happens to be right where we would need to be if all of those four conditions were met, um, those monies would then, of course, move up into the expenditures, okay? Um, and then let's just talk really quick about where the ending balances are in the different categories. Um, so if we look in the current year, um, the total ending balance, uh, $7.9 million at the bottom there or um, at the previous slide. So um, $2.5 million of those dollars are one-time dollars, they, so they can only be used on one-time expenditures. Um, we've got some um, restricted resource balances, or actually unrestricted resources, but... Um, designated for um, facility usage and so forth, our uh, monies that we receive in from uh, folks using our facilities, 44,000 revolving cash, 
Um, the minimum reserve for economic uncertainty is $3.5 million. And then above our 3%, you can see we have only 1.7, so we're not even at 6% this year. But it's always important that we look at a full multi-year um, projection. And so when we look out to 2018-19, you can see we have both the 3% minimum and then an additional 3%, as well as unassigned money, which um, that's some of the money that we have um, talked about in terms of eventually would move up into the expenditures based on what our bargaining agreements would eventually say. Okay, I hope I kept that to 15, 20 minutes. Are there any questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's always until we get those settlements. So no further questions. Oh, yeah. There are no further questions. We'll go ahead and vote. We're voting for a positive certification. And 14.3 carries with a 3-0 vote. Fifteen point one curriculum information item. Uh, new class philosophy and critical analysis meets A to G requirements. Fifteen point two revised course for middle school general music. Information item fifteen point three revolving cash report for February. Sixteen point one closed session. Necessary, correct? Yes. Okay. Do I, have, do I have a motion for closed session? Motion. I guess you're going to have to because nobody else can second. Okay. Please vote. No, oh, I'm sorry. That was Mr. Stafford for the motion and Mr. Garcia for the second. Please vote. All right, we are adjourned to closed session with a three reserve vote at 7.02.
Yeah, I told him off. Oh, that, that is me, yeah. They didn't wait for us? Anybody Judy's left? Here. Hey, Judy, come back here. Where are you going? We need one person. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go home, Judy. Come on, pull a card. Pull a card. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, you put me in my place. I'm sorry. Go yeah. By all means. She's great. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we will reconvene. Reconvening in public session at 720. Item 18. Excuse me. Item 18.1, discipline matters. Review of uh, discipline matters. This is an action item. Do I have a motion? Motion. Motion made by Mr. Stafford, second by Mr. Garcia. Do you guys have any questions on the expulsion reports? Questions, comments? I would just like to see more of uh, the behavioral contracts being marked, even if they're repeat, you know, they're being put up for expulsion. I don't want to see a blank. I want to know that we're still working with these individuals in the future as well. So maybe I could get that to be on the expulsion packet as well. No comment. Okay. If there are no more questions or comments. Please vote. Okay. There we go. Okay, that one uh, eighteen point one passes with a three zero vote. Uh, Nineteen point one. Other items by the superintendent. Do do I ask about making this motion, Lori? About okay. Um, there's uh, we'd like to ask the board to make a motion to um, for Mr. Nellison to ass assign another designer for our. Um, information that we have to uh, send out at tonight's meeting because Ms. Twyman is not here, who's our clerk, and Mr. Nellison is the vice president, so we need we need another signer. Okay, so the motion is to delegate authority to me, David Nellison, to sign documents as a result of tonight's meeting for the president and one of you for the clerk. Do I have <laughs> do I have a motion? Do, does Mr. Grant have a motion? Second. Motion was. I thought we had to make the motion. I thought we had to make the motion first. I'm sorry. The motion was made by Mr. Garcia and the and the second by Mr. Stafford. And who will sign? But Mr. Garcia is volunteering to be the clerk. So, so, any other questions? No. Okay. We're gonna have to do a manual vote. So, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed. Okay. So the motion carries three zero. And Nothing else to report. Nothing else. Mr. Okay, Nelson. thank you. Other items by the Board of Trustees, Mr. Garcia? None. Mr. Seth? None. And I just wanted to say that I did get a chance to go to the Puma, the sports challenge over at uh, Paris High School for at least uh, an, about an hour and a half. but And I got a chance to see one or two events, and it was very fun. I've been there before. I really enjoyed it. If you guys didn't get a chance to go this year, I highly recommend going next year. It's very cool. So, And anybody else who may be listening to this on, at home, go, go next year. It's, it's very cool. Okay. Uh, item 21.1, motion for adjournment. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Take your time there, Mr. Garcia. No, that's for CMI. 
Okay, so the motion was made by Mr. Stafford and the second was by Mr. Garcia. Please vote. Okay, motion carries 3-0 and we are adjourned at 724. Okay, so we are back with CMI. We are so we are uh, we are um, reconvening CMI board meeting at seven twenty-five. We will continue with 11.1, .1, the invitation to address the Board of Trustees on closed session items only. No takers today. So I need a motion to adjourn to closed session. Motion. Second. Mr. Stafford with a motion, Mr. Garcia with a second. Please vote. And we are adjourned to closed session at 726. At 732. That was good enough. Okay. Uh, report out of closed session if necessary. No report. Thank you. Uh, motion for adjournment. Second. Mr. Garcia with the motion. Mr. Stafford for the, with a second. Please vote. Motion carries 3-0, and hold up, wait for it, wait for it. We are adjourned at 7.33.